Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com, and I'm an international chess coach for beginners and intermediate players. And on the screen before you, you see the tabia for Janowski's defense or Janowski's variation of the old Indian defense. And this was in a game at the Hastings International Premier Chess Tournament. The Hastings International Chess Congress is uh, an annual tournament which takes place in Hastings, England, which is on the southern coast of England, south of London. And typically it's held uh, at the turn of the year. So you'll see these described as um, two years. This one would be 1925-26. The main event is the Hastings Premier Tournament, which was traditionally a 10 to 16 player round robin event. Although in 2004-2005, it was played in a knockout format, and the 05-06 and 0607 editions were Swiss systems. Typically, along with the main event, there are challengers sections, which are open to all players. And the winner of the challengers section gets an automatic invitation to the premiere in the following year. In addition to the annual international tournament at the Christmas time, Hastings has also hosted international tournaments at irregular intervals in its Summer Chess Congress. The most celebrated of those was the 1895 edition, which featured two world champions and nearly all of the top players in the world at that time. Every world champion before Bobby Fischer had participated in Hastings. Uh, Bobby had a chance, and then, if I remember correctly, he rescheduled to play in the U.S. Chess Championship. Wilhelm Steinitz played in 1895. Lasker also. Capablanca played in 1919. 1929-30 and 30-31, as well as 34-35. Alexander Alyekin played in 1922, 25-26, 33-34, and 36-37. Dr. Max Hervé played in 1923-24, 30-31 and 31-32, 34-35, 45-46, and 49-50. Michal Botvinnik played in 1934-35, 1961-62, and the 66-67 edition. Vasily Smyslov played in 1954 and 55, as well as the 62-63 and 68-69 versions. Mikhail Tal played in 63-64. Tigran Petrosian played 77-78. Boris Spassky played 65-66. Fisher, as I mentioned, missed his chance, and um, Anatoly Karpov did play in Hastings as well, 71-72. Vera Menchik of Czechoslovakia, who was women's world champion at the time, was the first woman to play in the premier section, participating in seven of these events, spanning from 1929-30 through 1936-37. In 1963-64, Nona Gaprindashvili won the challenger section, and uh, she was also world champion at the time for women. That earned her a spot in the following year's premiere. And in 1964-65, she scored five out of nine to place fifth, and was able to beat all of the British masters in the tournament. Another notable woman who played was Judith Polgar, and she tied for first place in the 1992-93 Premier Tournament. Now, George Marshall Norman was born on the 15th day of February 1880 in Brighton. He was educated at the Brighton Grammar School and Brighton Technical College, winning a scholarship to the Imperial College of Science at London University. 
He spent five years uh, where he studied chemistry, obtaining a Bachelor of Science. And about 1905, he went to Barry as the head of the pure and applied chemistry departments in their technical school. In 1919, he was appointed the headmaster of the Municipal School of Science in Hastings and soon joined the Hastings Chess Club and entered into a very successful period in his chess career, as well as winning the club championship seven times out of nine attempts in the 1920s. He became Sussex champion in 1923, 28, 30, and 31, and he competed in eight of these Hastings Premier Tournaments. He died on the 27th of June, 1966, in London at the age of 86. After his death, the Worthing Gazette introduced the Norman Award, which was given annually to the player gaining the best score for Sussex in a season of the SCCU Championship. David Yanovsky was born May 25th, 1868 and passed away January 15th, 1927. He was born into a Jewish-Polish family in Volkovist in the Russian Empire, and that's now in Belarus. He settled in Paris around 1890 and began his professional chess career in 1894. Yanovsky won tournaments in Monte Carlo in 1901, Hanover in 1902. He tied for first at Vienna 1902. And he also later won at Atlantic City at the 8th American Chess Congress. Yanovsky devastated some of the older masters, such as Wilhelm Steinitz, having a record of five wins and two losses. Mikhail Chigorin, he destroyed with 17 wins, four losses, and four draws. A strong finish against Joseph Henry Blackburn with six wins, two losses, and two draws. But he had minus scores against the newer generation. Players such as Siegbert Tarash, he had five wins, nine losses, three draws. Against Frank Marshall, he had 28 wins, 34 losses, and 18 draws. Against Akiva Rubinstein, he had three wins and five losses. Against Giza Morozzi, five wins, 10 losses, five draws. Against Carl Schlechter, 13 wins, 20 losses, 13 draws. He was clearly outclassed by world champions Emmanuel Lasker and Jose Raul Capablanca. Against Lasker, he had four wins, 25 losses, and seven draws. And that included a world championship match that he lost in 1910. He was also owned by Capablanca, only ever winning once against him, losing nine times and one draw. He did have a respectable record against Alexander Alyekin, with two wins, four losses, and two draws. Yanovsky played very quickly and was known as a sharp tactician who was devastating with the bishop pair. Capablanca annotated some of Yanovsky's games with great admiration, and he said, when in form, he is one of the most feared opponents who can exist. Capablanca noted that Yanovsky's greatest weakness as a player was in the end game, and Yanovsky reportedly told him, I detest the end game. American champion Frank Marshall remembered Yanovsky's talent and stubbornness. In Marshall's best games of chess, he wrote that Yanovsky could follow the wrong path with greater determination than any man I ever met. Ruben Fine remembered Yanovsky as a player of considerable talent, but a master of the alibi. <laughs> Don't forget to get Coach Daniel's catalog of chess excuses. Uh, a master of the alibi with respect to his defeats. Fine said that his losses invariably occurred because it was too hot or too cold or the windows were open too far or not far enough. He also noted that Yanovsky was sometimes unpopular with his colleagues because of his predilection for doggedly playing on, even in obviously lost positions, hoping his opponent might blunder. All right. That gives you some background about the players and the event where this was first deployed by Yanovsky. I couldn't find any records where Yanovsky won with this. Um, 
and it could be just that they haven't survived, but I don't know. But we start with a D4 and an Indian game, the Knight F6. C4 is then played to strengthen White's control of the center, particularly the D5 square, which is very important. And of course, that also allows White to develop his Queen's Knight to the active C3 square without blocking the C man. D6 is the old Indian defense, one of my favorites. Mikhail Chigorin pioneered this defense late in his career. And it was sort of the original version of the King's Indian and can actually transpose to a King's Indian defense. Or it can follow less popular lines with a strategy similar to the King's Indian defense. Some King's Indian players will use the old Indian to avoid certain anti-King's Indian systems such as the Samish or Averbach variations. Unlike the classical defenses to d4, black does not blockade the white d-man, but instead prepares to play e5, attacking the pawn. Compared to the king's Indian, black does not fianchetto his king's bishop. He plays it rather to e7. Knight c3. And now Janowski's variation. And the idea behind Janowski's variation is to prevent white from immediately grabbing space with pawn e4. The variation didn't gain much popularity into the late 1980s, but several top level players have employed the line on multiple occasions, including the former world champion Michal Tal. F3 is the main line, declaring that white has every intention of playing pawn e4. And now knight b d7 gets a question mark from our annotator. This move seems to have been pioneered by the California state champion Harry Bodokov in 1921 when he played it against Sammy Ryshevsky, who was conducting a simultaneous exhibition in Los Angeles. Borokov successfully held Ryshevsky to a draw. E5 is and has come to be the most commonly played move in this line. And the most common continuation I'll show you right here is E4, transposing back to a book move. Pawn takes D4. Queen takes D4. Knight c6 hitting the queen. Queen back to d2. Bishop e6. Pawn b3. Pawn g6. Bishop b2. Bishop g7, king's knight to e2, and kingside castles. Let's go back. Instead, Janowski with queen's knight to d7. Pawn e4. Bishop g6, Bishop d3, not particularly cared for by the annotator who prefers g4. Note that knight g to e2 has been played a couple of times, including in the aforementioned Ryshevsky Borokov game. But in this game, bishop d3. e5 is played and d5. My preference instead of d5 is bishop e3. The annotator prefers king's knight to e2. What do we get for bishop e3? 
I do get a thumbs up for that move. D5 by Norman. Knight H5. Now Bishop E3. And it seems white is a touch better here. Bishop E7. Queen D2. Knight C5. Not liked. I have no real issue with this move. Bishop C2. Pawn A5. Again, it seems like a reasonable move to me, but the bot not caring for it. The bot really wanting to control the g5 square. Knight g e2 on h6 is now played. g3, and with g3, this knight's job is done and should come back. Instead, he played bishop g5, and the bot agrees with me. f4, pawn takes the pawn, pawn takes the pawn, bishop h4 check, and king d1. Now the knight comes back, but he should probably castle now before he does anything else. And the bot agrees with that statement as well. Now, e5 is a mistake. He should take this knight first. And the point is, when you take the knight, that attracts this pawn away from the defense of e5. So that e5 can then be played and not be captured by the pawn that used to be on d6. But, oops, I went back too far. E5 was played. And here bishop takes bishop was played by Janowski. I didn't care for this move. Uh, I wanted to play knight to uh, E4 and hit their queen. And the point is, he'll have to take with his knight, then you can take with your other endangered knight. Well, let me just put it up there. Knight to e4, hitting the queen, it gets a star. And after knight takes knight, knight takes knight, with this, let's see what we get for knight takes knight. A question mark. <laughs> the point is, after knight takes knight, knight takes knight, bishop takes knight, bishop takes bishop, comes in to hit that rook on h1 which he'll have to move to g1. Let's go back. Bishop takes c2 was played with check. And that's given the big red x by the annotator. King takes the bishop. And now knight f to d7. Again, I would have rather put this knight on e4 and trade knights. I get a star for that. Etc. But he played knight fd7, and it is given a question mark by the bot. Queen d4. Queen e7. Knight b5. Your rook on g1 would be appealing. Aiming up here at this weak spot. Knight a6 was played here, defending the c-man. I don't know why you would not save your C-man. Uh, this is given a red X, but that makes 
perfect sense to me. Why, why give away the pawn if you don't have to? So I favor Janowski's move over the annotators. Knight EC3. And soon the rook's coming to G1. Bot not liking this either. But the eval bar favors white, so it can't be that bad. Now, here I'd like to play the check with my knight. Janowski, very understandably, doesn't care for the pressure that is abiding here. So he trades. It gets a thumbs up, but the bot does concur that knight b4 check. And after the king gets out of check, we can go ahead and castle. I think. It gets a star. And the point is, now if he takes the pawn, let's say he takes the pawn here, I'll play rook a c8 and get a very active rook. Let's go back. Pawn takes pawn was Janowski's choice. Pawn takes the pawn. And he'd love to get d6 played. Janowski now castles. And that's given... A question mark. Sure, you've got a super attack on this pawn. Why not grab it? All right, so Queen's Rook to G1 is played, and so Black has to deal with the threat of Bishop takes H6. And his approach is to obstruct the bishop with bishop g5. Bishop takes bishop, pawn takes bishop. I'm really wanting d6, as I mentioned earlier, but Norman played knight e4. The bot gives that a question mark and calls for pawn h4. What does it think of pawn d6 hitting the queen? I get a star. And that'll force pawn takes pawn, but then pawn takes pawn. And you've got another hit on the queen. And you'll have to move your queen. Perhaps to e5. I get a star. But nonetheless, d6 getting a star and white's eval bar is very favorable indeed knight e4 and now queen takes the pawn on e5 rook takes the pawn on g5 defended by the knight but queen takes queen does make sense Queen takes queen was the move. And after knight takes, then you can pick up the pawn. But rook takes the pawn. Queen takes the queen. Knight takes the queen. Now queen's rook to e8, a very good move getting that rook active and on the open file with tempo against the undefended knight. <laughs> the bot says that's a good idea, just the wrong rook, which brings me to my favorite Oscar Pano quote. Oscar Pano, the Argentine grandmaster, one of the Argentine grandmasters, famously said, when you have two rooks that can go to the same square, 
you must carefully calculate and consider what move to make. And once you've made up your mind, move the other rook. I have no objection to queen's rook to e8. That's the move I chose, so it can't be that bad. <laughs> uh, here I would play rook e1, but Norman with knight to g3. The bot saying knight d2 was a better choice. What's it think of rook e1? A thumbs up. Knight g3 was GM Norman's choice. He was a GM of George Marshall. <laughs> Rook e5. Knight g to f5. Pawn g6. Norman doubles his rooks. Rook f e8, doubling his rooks. And knight e6. Hmm. That's quite a move. I'm not sure whether to be amazed or horrified by knight e6. It gets a question mark. Well... The point is, he's trying to get you to take that knight with your pawn, but that would be a blunder. Janowski wisely played king h7, which gets a thumbs up. If you play pawn takes the knight, you're going to be sorry after rook takes the pawn. Check. And after king f7, rook g7, check. And after king f6... Knight h6, don't play um, knight, uh, don't play knight d4 here um, because of rook e4. Uh, but knight h6 and then rook e2 check can be played. But king d3 and we'll play rook takes the b man. And after king c3, we'll take the a man. We go up into gobble, gobble mode. Um, we got to be careful, though. He can take our knight. Now, we can give check. And we've got an equal game, basically. We could, we could just... Um, well, we could play. After he plays king b2... We could play rook b3 check because if he takes, it's a fork. Oh, double x glam. If he takes it, he gets forked right here. So I got a double x glam on that. Let's go back. Anyway, don't play. Pawn takes knight. King h7 is the right way to go. Now, speaking of having two different pieces that can move to the same square, and once you've made up your mind, choose the other, here I would play knight ed4 rather than knight fd4. I don't mind if black opens this file. So I would prefer knight ed4. Let's see what I get. I get a star. All right. He played knight fd4 and gets an inaccuracy. So now pawn takes e6, rook takes pawn. Knight f8. I'm actually thinking knight c5 myself here. 
Um, knight f8 was played. The bot likes knight b4. What's it think about knight c5? A check mark. Well, I guess after here, I'll play king h8. And I should, I should be holding on to my advantage by a thread. The rook defending the g8 square. Knight f8, though, undefends the g8 square. Rook g7, check, king h6. Rook g8. Pawn takes the pawn is a blunder. In order to hold this draw, he has to play king h7. But this is a blunder. Look at the eval bar. And it's a blunder because white controls the g file and can play rook h8 check. Astonishingly, Norman did not play rook h8 check. He played rook one to g3, getting an X, and the eval bar lunges back to center. Well, the thing is about rook h8 check is it forces knight h7. And then that uncovers this rook, which can be traded off. Knight f5 can come in here with check forcing the king to h5. And now you have a fork. And that will be that. A rook and a knight against two knights should win every day of the week, even though black has a couple of pawns. Well, one extra pawn, that's not going to be enough. <clears throat> An unfortunate miss by Norman, who played rook one g3. And now after rook one g3, king h7 holds the draw. Knight e6 will be threatened here. Think about knight e6 is if you take, then I'm taking with check, discovering a hit here. Now, obviously, you still don't want to play the pawn takes um, pawn here. You don't want to go pawn grabbing because that allows a checkmate, rook h3, the whole point of rook 1, g3. And all black can do is block, but now the knight can come in with check. And it's all over. I'm going to give you a check here. And after the forced king h8, we'll grab this. Only one legal move checkmate so I think we all knew that so king h7 was necessary rook 3 g7 king back to h6 if black is ever allowed to play knight e6 he'll win but he'll never be allowed to play that well, maybe here, rook g3. He played king h7 and the game was drawn. Maybe you could go ahead and play knight e6 here. I get a double x glam? No, it changed its mind. It started to say double x glam. And the point is, you cannot take the knight because rook takes the rook. And on rook takes the rook, 
I have a rook and a knight against a rook again. But it would be worth a try. Surely white would play rook h3 and force the rook h5. And here, well, let's be clear on this. Here, if you play, well, you'd have to play rook takes the rook. And go into a rook versus two knights endgame. Because you could not play the the line that we showed earlier with knight f5 check. Because it no longer works because you no longer have rook g7. Because the knight is here. Now, you could take this with check, but that's going to give up the other rook, isn't it? So, um, you'd have to play the capture and, and go for this endgame. Now, actually, here I could play knight f5, and after pawn takes... Um, it's There's still a fight to the end, but it should be drawn. Probably just b6. Should be fine. Yep. Okay. That's the Yanovsky game featuring Yanovsky's variation. And I am starting an entire playlist on Yanofsky's variation, we're going to show some of the top players of history that have deployed Yanofsky's variation and how it came out. So until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.